Chapter 4. Response to the Easter Messages. It is tragic indeed that the birth pangs of Christianity were occasioned by an event in which Jews were directly implicated. Ellis Rivkin, What Crucified Christ? Page 3. As previously mentioned, in 1964 the Roman Pope decreed that all of us are guilty of the death of Christ. This was one of the first times in the nearly two millennia that guilt was shifted from the Jews to someone or something else. Then even more recently, the Jewish scholar, Ellis Rivkin, tells us that the issue is not who but what killed Jesus, and he put the blame on the imperial system. But systems do not function independently all by themselves people direct them. All governments, like machinery, are designed, built, and operated by human beings, including the Roman or Jewish system of government. Naturally, Rivkin, a Jew himself, would tend to steer around the issue that for nearly two millennia, Jews have been blamed for the death of Jesus. We cannot blame him because it is natural for one to defend his own religion, race and politics. And certainly it is not correct to say that all Jews were guilty of the deed. Among the first Christians were Jews, and they had held great responsibilities until the time of Christ, as indicated in the great patriarchal blessing pronounced upon them by their forefather Jacob. So, in our search for accuracy, we need to go back to some semblance of historical records that contain events happening about the time of Jesus. Rivkin went to the general historian, Josephus, for most of his information. However, Josephus gave us only one reference to Christ in all of his historical work. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works a teacher of such men, as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews, and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Antiquities of the Jews, B.K. 18, Chap. 3, Paragraph 3. Fortunately, we can grasp a much better understanding of events from the scriptures written by disciples who were there than we can from Josephus who was not there, even though three of the four Gospels were written years after the fact, all but John's. It is interesting to note, concerning the death of Christ, that Josephus had only one reference to him, and, on the other hand, the Apostle John had only one reference to the Romans. However, we are indebted to Flavius Josephus, 37-95 AD, for shedding much light on the history of the Jews and Romans at this time. He was a military leader defending the Jews in the province of Galilee, and became a prisoner of the Romans, at which time he witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army. Subsequently, he lived in Rome where he wrote the history of the Jewish war and the antiquities of the Jews. Rivkin wrote that Jesus so frightened Rome that he had to die, the fact is that Rome had built an empire so strong that it controlled nearly all the world for almost 1,000 years. They had the largest and best equipped and best trained army. They were not afraid of any single man nor his religion. In fact, they did not consider any religion to be a threat to their glorious empire. They had a host of gods of their own, and even set up an altar for the unknown god, as they didn't want to offend any god by overlooking him. The man Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey with his followers throwing flowers before him does not depict the type of enemy that would frighten the Roman army. Picture of Jesus riding the donkey. Jesus never committed any crime against the Romans, and they even admitted that. Once he paid a tax that he didn't rightfully owe, but Peter had said he would do so, so it was paid. See Matt. 1724-27. On another occasion he said to render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Matt. 2221, he thus avoided a rebellion. In his responding Easter article, Bishop Niederauer said that, Rivkin does a service to Christians and non-Christians alike, when he shifts the question from who to what crucified Christ, we would like to know why? Was it the Nazi government at fall for World War II or the Nazi leaders who ran the government? Should a police officer write out a ticket to an automobile for speeding and recklessness instead of the driver? We can't blame a car for what a driver does with it, nor can we blame governments for what people do with them. Governments can be good or bad, depending on who runs them. It is the people, not the government, that determine how that political system will function. As Brigham Young once explained, the government of heaven, if wickedly administered, would become one of the worst governments upon the face of the earth. No matter how good a government is, unless it is administered by righteous men, an evil government will be made of it. JD 10177
Conversely, a bad government can be turned into a good one if good people take it over. The good Bishop Niederauer correctly stated that moral evil exists in social structures and individual behavior alike and again, what crucified Jesus Christ was human sinfulness. Therefore, more correctly, the question about the responsibility of Christ's crucifixion should be centered on who did it, not what. Bishop Niederauer properly stated that the facts of this issue can be spoken of without anti-Semitism. We are looking at an event that occurred in history, and we don't need to change history to avoid anti-Semitism. Facts are sometimes difficult to bear, but they remain facts whether we like them or not. We shouldn't change history because of the outcome of something that happened many years before. We study the facts of history either to avoid or repeat the results of some prior event. If some friends were driving their car across the country and were robbed by a gang of German hoodlums, we shouldn't record the event by saying they came by train and had an uneventful trip just to avoid anti-Germanism. The most amazingly inaccurate statement in Rivkin's book was that the Gospels confirmed that no institution of Judaism had anything to do with the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. It seems inconceivable how a scholar could completely overlook all of those implications recorded by the Apostle John. How could he overlook the whole book? Bishop Niederauer couldn't agree with his statement either. Pastor Harbaugh stated, Our history suggests that Jews and Christians know enough about such painful history to join together on behalf of the oppressed and needy, rather than stand apart. Perhaps our Lord is working through scholars like Rivkin and others to provide the groundwork for such reconciliation. S.L. Tribune, April 11, 1998. That's a beautiful concept, but too often we endeavor to change history to make these compromises. In the case of scholars like Rivkin who have changed the question from who to what, it is not too different from changing history itself. We don't need to rewrite history, or avoid it, to patch up differences. A false history is worse than no history. As we previously stated, we cannot blame a Jewish historian for attempting to reverse the popular belief that the Jews were to blame for the crucifixion of Christ, but now we have the Catholic and Protestant clergy also beginning to change their previous opinions and views about the crucifixion. Indeed they are guilty of trying to change history as well. Picture of Roman soldiers. Were Roman soldiers the real killers of Christ? Or were they just carrying out orders? We are familiar with the compassionate statement of Jesus at his crucifixion. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, Luke 23:34, which is found in the King James translation of the Bible. However, in the inspired translation by Joseph Smith, a small insert clarifies what he meant. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, meaning the soldiers who crucified him, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Luke 23, 35. In other words, the Roman soldiers did not know nor recognize Jesus as the Messiah and Redeemer of the world, they were just doing their job as any executioner was expected to do. However, the Jewish leaders knew who he was, and they could not be forgiven for what they did the shedding of innocent blood, 